My name is Alexandra. I'm 24 and I'm from Manchester in the UK. I'm sure everyone, male, female, and everyone in between will agree that one of the single worst parts about dating is that you never really know who you're dealing with until you really know them. Guys who you thought were complete knobheads turn out to be really sweet and caring when you get to know them, like they're coding their idealism in a moody shell to avoid being ridiculed or risking getting hurt. That sounds very amateur psychologist of me, I know, but it's just the way I see it. However, taking a chance on those kind of guys is, well, just that. Taking a massive chance. I've read a guy wrong once and ended up on a date where he just kept trying to pour shots down my throat so I'd be drunk enough to, well, you know. And after that, I decided to play it a little bit safer and go for the nicer, more gentle, manly guys. They might be a little bit boring or prudish sometimes, but at least they put effort into their dates and you can have a nice time with them. But like I said, sometimes the nice guys turn out to be not so nice. Now spoilers, but I'm in the middle of getting a restraining order against the guy I'm about to tell you about and he's already been to court over the incident in this story, so for legal reasons I'm not going to name him because it might actually affect the court's decision if they ever came to hear about this. I know the guy trawls the internet for any mention of me or him or this event and as much as I can make my social private and block his own, I can't exactly make some big YouTube channels private, can I? And I honestly don't know how much he knows about my favorite corners of the internet so I can't take a chance on it. I know it sounds unbelievably stupid but this could actually be used against me in court which is why I gave you my middle name and not my actual first. The justice system in this country is so stupid that it could literally be seen as a provocation, and his solicitors could maybe even get the whole restraining order thrown out of court. But how that's even possible with his conviction for breaking and entering and brandishing a deadly weapon, I have no bloody idea. Because that's what he did. After I decided that, as nice as he was, we just weren't meshing, he decided to scare the life out of me. But then the worst thing, he actually missed me being home and ended up basically traumatizing my flatmate. I had absolutely no suspicion that he'd ever do anything like that either. Like when I called him after two months of dating to tell him, I'm not sure this is going to work. All he really asked in objection was, don't you think you're being a bit hasty? And is there anything I can do or say to change your mind? Obviously the answer to both questions was no that I'd made my decision and it needed to be respected. After that, he didn't say anything else really. He just kept saying, okay, over and over, until I finally ended the call. No one takes that kind of news well, I know that, but he took it better than some guys I've broken things off with. So, like I said, there was absolutely no clue that he'd ever do anything so drastic as to break his way into my flat. But as I also said, that's not all he did. I remember being on my way home from work and texting my flatmate to ask if she had anything in mind for tea. We always got really excited, still do about our Friday night dinners, as we always scrolled through Uber Eats to find something we fancied. It was a bit of a ritual, something we always look forward to, so I thought it was really weird that she didn't text back right away. But then as I was on the tram, five minutes went by, then ten, then fifteen, and she not only hadn't texted back, she hadn't even read the message. I didn't exactly freak out though, I mean it wasn't out of the question that she wasn't busy or something, so I decided I'd just wait until I got home before talking to her about it face to face. But then when I got home, and I tried to put my key in the lock, it didn't slide in, it actually opened up the door. Then the next thing I noticed, the thing that really had my blood running cold, was the big black spray-painted graffiti on the off-white wallpaper of our hallway. You did this, it said. And even then, because of how seemingly well the guy had taken me calling time on things, I didn't draw the connection until I found my flatmate locked in her room, crying her eyes out on the phone with the police. I had to wait until she was off the phone, until she told me what the guy had looked like, for me to realize actually what had happened and who'd done it. My flatmate said that she'd had a knock on the door, looked through the peephole, and saw a guy standing outside in the hall wearing a COVID mask. 
Now, back in the summer of 2021, it was totally normal to see people wearing masks. Not everyone, but definitely a lot more than you see these days, now that the government has ditched all the regulations and stuff. In fact, I think it'll be a long bloody time before anyone sees anyone in a surgical mask and thinks, why are they obscuring the lower two-thirds of their face? But anyway, she sees the guy in the mask, doesn't think anything of it, and opens the door to see what he wants. Now, the guy had already been in our flat, but not when my flatmate was around, as I'd ask her to vacate for a few hours, and you can probably guess why that is. He asks her, Is Alexandra here? And she replies, No. And I suppose that must have really thrown a spanner into the works of his plan. He wanted me to be there. He needed me to be there, so he would... God knows what he was planning. But that didn't stop him from forcing his way in and completely trashing the place. My flatmate said after he forced his way in, he pinned her up against the wall by her throat and kept demanding to know, Where's Alex? Where's Alex? She must have known I was on my way home from work, or at least I was about to clock out. But she didn't say a word. To be fair, she said she was too scared to say anything at all. But I still put that very much into the she had my back column and I love her for it. When he realized that she wasn't going to say anything, the guy proceeded to basically smash up the entire flat before doing his little spray paint job to make sure that I knew who did it. When he stomped off into the TV and kitchenette room, my flatmate ran into her bedroom and locked the doors, and that's pretty much where she stayed for the next 45 minutes or so, until I got home and she heard me walking around. I honestly couldn't believe the amount of damage he'd done. It was catastrophic. My flatmate said as much as it felt like he was there forever, it must have only been a couple of minutes of banging and crashing before it all went quiet again. But in that time, he'd managed to smash almost everything. The telly, all our dishes and glasses, the frame pictures on the walls, the windows. He'd even tried to smash the glass window door thing on our washing machine, although that was so thick that he'd only managed to crack and splinter it. There were holes in the walls, in the kitchenette's cabinet doors, little ones where he'd obviously used a hammer or something to do the smashing. I can only imagine what he'd done to me if I was actually home, and I think it's a bit of a miracle that he didn't hurt my flatmate. I think he actually tried, as she said he'd tried to open the locked door and banged on it when it didn't open. We think he could hear her talking to the 999 operator, and that's what prompted him to make a run for it. But it's truly chilling to think she was just a meter or two away from a complete psychopath with a hammer or a mallet or whatever it was, and he was blatantly intent on hurting someone. It took a few days for him to actually get arrested since a friend of his played at being his alibi until the police pressured him into telling the truth. I think all it took was, if this goes to court, you'll be found guilty of perjury, then you'll get a criminal record and that's the end of your career. And after that, he fessed up that the guy I'd been dating hadn't been with him on that Friday night. After that, given how the description of him and the history lined up, he was arrested on suspicion of breaking and entering, as well as brandishing a deadly weapon, and I think making threats to kill, too. It went to court, but because he pled guilty and had no prior criminal history, he basically claimed diminished responsibility due to the stress of COVID. Turned out both his grandparents had passed away in a care home, and he only got a two-year suspended sentence. His solicitors painted the whole thing as a lover's tiff, and the judge ate it up because I admitted that we'd been dating for a few months. To me, my flatmate, and both our families, it was a complete miscarriage of justice. Someone like that, who we know would have inflicted horrific injuries on us, possibly even killed us. They belong in prison for a long, long time. We were in a state of shock, but above all, we were scared. We knew if he tried anything, he'd go straight to prison for a maximum of 10 years, depending on how bad the offense was. But that wasn't enough for us, not for me, and not for my flatmate, and not for our families. So, that's why I'm going for a restraining order. If it goes through the courts and gets instated, if he comes within 50 feet of me, then that's that. He's breaking the law and he'll go to prison. So, 
that's what I'm resting all my hopes on. It's much less hassle than us packing up and moving flats, and I feel like that would be giving into the fear that he wanted to inflict on us. Instead, I'm hoping the solicitor's fees we paid to get the restraining order before a judge will be worth it. Because if it doesn't work, if it hits us that we're still just as vulnerable as we were before, I just don't know what I'll do. I came across your channel and I think it's really cool that you give people a chance to share their traumas with a wide audience. I believe that a problem shared is a problem halved and getting to unburden ourselves by sharing our stories both validates our suffering and alleviates some of the stress of having them locked inside our heads. My story isn't like a lot of the others on your channel where the person suffers because something happened to them. In fact, I feel rather awkward sending this to you because... I'm not suffering because something happened to me, rather, I'm suffering because something didn't happen to me. Allow me to explain. In 2009, my husband of just two years passed away after being involved in a car accident. A group of drunken teenage boys had stolen a car one night and lost control of it while speeding around a blind corner. They crashed into a waist-high wall right at the same time my husband happened to be walking home from the pub. He'd been out with a few work friends, getting a few pints in to celebrate the weekend, and he just so happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time when those boys lost control of the car. They say he died instantly, that the impact broke his body almost in half, and I think that was the only real consolation I got, knowing he didn't suffer after those boys smashed into him. I won't bore you with the details of my grieving process, but I will say that it was long. It was a very hard road. I didn't even consider dating until the summer of 2015, and even then, it was a very slow and cautious re-emergence into the dating world, into really the world at all. I'm not exactly the nightclub type, and I found speed dating to be, well, too fast-paced. My friends offered to set me up with their more successful single friends, but I found that not having a hand in the selection made me really anxious, and I'd much rather choose my own dates instead of having them match made for me. That's when I really found my rhythm with online dating and specifically the website Plenty of Fish. I thought the name was a bit inappropriate at first. After all, I hadn't gone through some sitcom style breakup involving rom-coms and tubs of ice cream. I'd lost the love of my life. But being able to actually vet my dates myself while getting to know them at a comfortable distance, that really suited me. I talked to a number of different guys during the summer and autumn of 2015, but one of them was a guy named Carl, who told me he owned his own law firm. Carl was from a place called Chessent, just north of London, but he said he was living closer to Tottenham as his firm was based nearer the city centre. He seemed intelligent and charming, and although he was definitely a little bit quirky, he was one of the more interesting guys I talked to during my time on Plenty of Fish. He certainly seemed to know how to treat a woman on a first date too, and mentioned that he wanted to take me to a place called Theobald's Park Hotel out in Hertfordshire. I looked the place up online and my god was it posh. It's an old red brick mansion looking thing set into the middle of the countryside. It has a big green lawn out in the front lined on one side with daffodils. I mean, it really was one of the most incredible looking places I'd ever laid eyes on and I'd be lying if I said I wasn't looking forward to being taken there by a bloke who had a few quid to blow on some gourmet food and drink. But as I said, I wasn't the meet him on Monday, date him on Friday kind of girl, so despite the beginning of our conversation being in about September of 2015, we got to November and I still don't think that I was actually ready to meet Carl. Shortly after that, he stopped replying to my messages and I figured he just moved on to a girl whose time frame was more hair than tortoise, I suppose. I was a bit gutted, as, uh, like I said, he seemed really interesting and definitely seemed like he was financially capable of starting a family. But in reality, his sudden disappearance from my inbox was probably one of the best things to happen to me in years. I honestly thought that was the last I'd ever hear of or about Carl, and for a month or so, I forgot all about him as I carried on my merry dating way. 
on Christmas Day of 2015, I heard something rather chilling on the news. A woman's body had been found in the grounds of the Theobalds Park Hotel out in Hertfordshire, the very place Carl had promised to take me on the date that didn't happen, and the police suspected foul play was to blame. I think I'd have had more time to think about it if I wasn't driving up to my mum's for Christmas dinner, as not long after I heard the news, I was far too busy catching up with family to think about something so terribly grim. It did rattle around my mind for the better part of an hour though, as I considered how rotten it was that something so horrid should happen in such a beautiful place. That was pretty much where my thoughts started and ended though, and aside from feeling sorry for whoever had been unfortunate enough to find the poor woman's body, I didn't really think anything else of it. The next thing I remember I was tapping a link on my phone for the Guardian's website that read, Man Charged Over Christmas Eve Hotel Death. When the page loaded up, I almost dropped my phone in horror. The phone had released the name of the person they'd arrested on suspicion of murder, and to my infinite shock and eventual disgust, the name of the man was Carl Langdell. The very same Carl I'd been talking to on Plenty of Fish. There was no picture of the suspect attached to the news article, but it was the same name, the same age, and the mention of the hotel tied the whole thing together in a big jet black bow. The victim was a woman named Katie Locke, who taught history and politics at Cardinal Pole Catholic School in East London. It sounds really horrible in retrospect, but I was absolutely riveted by the news. I mean, that could have been me, couldn't it? I was gearing up to go on a date with someone at the very same place he ended up murdering someone, or at least he was accused of murdering someone, because obviously I'd have to wait until all the facts were out before I could actually know what had happened. The following is pretty much everything I learned from the time of his arrest to his eventual sentencing and the inquest into Katie Locke's death that followed his imprisonment. Carl had told me, and Katie as it turned out, that he owned his own law firm, I know now that this was a lie. He initially told police that he was a perfectly normal person, and Katie's death was a tragic case of a bedroom asphyxiation game gone wrong. In reality, he was someone who harbored hideous fantasies related to intimate relations with the deceased. Carl had not been working to set up the law firm. Instead, he had spent the majority of 2014 and 2015 battling a very severe and very dark mental illness. After assaulting his own brother, attacking his girlfriend's sister, and then threatening to kill a mental health worker, he had been detained under the Mental Health Act in March of 2015, and it was during this period of detention that he described himself to a psychiatrist as a monster before confessing his dark fantasies to her. Somehow, even after this confession, he was released from custody in the autumn of 2015, but as I've already mentioned, this is around the same time that he messaged me on Plenty of Fish. He lied to mental health professionals, faking a recovery and telling them that he was no longer fantasizing about relations with the dead. All the while, he had set up his Plenty of Fish profile and was in the process of turning those fantasies into a reality. And in a sick twist of fate, I was almost a part of them. At Carl's murder trial during the summer of 2016, I read that he'd actually changed course and pled guilty to Katie's murder. A judge then sentenced him to 26 years in prison and, once again, I thought that was the last I'd ever hear about him. But, once again, I was wrong. Early last year, I heard that Carl had actually taken his own life in a prison up in Yorkshire. And, as you can probably imagine, I wasn't in the least bit upset to hear he'd done so. To be frank with you, I know for a fact that there's people who deserve to have long and happy lives that had them cut short for no good reason, my husband and Katie Locke among them. So to have a self-described monster take himself out of the world before his due date, well, that's no loss to anyone, is it? I think this is an appropriate time to end my story and maybe this shouldn't have come from Katie's family or perhaps some of the other people that Carl actually hurt or threatened to hurt before he was sent to prison. But the fact that I came so close to a horrifying death, and the fact that it 
really could have been my body being found on the grounds of the Theobalds Park Hotel. That's something I find truly haunting. This is a weird one, so strap yourself in. I have a friend who has a really gross or rather really interesting job depending on how you look at it. She works for Tinder, you know, the dating app. And pretty much all day every day, she reviews profile pictures that other users have reported for whatever reason. Some of these can be for pretty basic rule-breaking stuff, you know, offensive things, gestures, suspected catfishes, that kind of thing. But then every so often, she gets something that's actually really disturbing. And this one time, she said it was so bad that it wasn't just a case of removing the picture or banning the person's profile, she actually had to contact the police. As you can imagine, there are a lot of pictures of guys' stuff on Tinder, and maybe that would surprise you, the sheer number of dudes, both gifted and not so gifted, who want to just show themselves off, or maybe it wouldn't. Either way, she sees an awful lot of those, and she's got pretty hardened to it over time, no pun intended. But then there's the stuff that actually still gets to her. The offensive memes or clothing, yes, the clothing that you might see, Violence towards animals. Some guys don't just hold the fish in their picture. And then there's the violence towards actual people. Yeah, some people upload pictures of bodies to try and be all edgy. Some upload pictures of bloodied, knocked out people with captions like, I KO'd this idiot. Tinder truly does get a cross section of society on it, and as we all know, a portion of society is made up of total lunatics. But then, like I said before, there are some pictures that makes her literally wish she was just looking at some wrinkly middle-aged old dude's twig and berries. She says she works with this system that looks a lot like an old school email account. Little emails pop up in your inbox detailing the user, the reason for reporting, and the actual picture in question. She's clicking through all the pictures one day, removing some, banning others, when she comes across one that actually made her jump. She said the picture was of a guy kneeling by what looked like an unconscious girl and had this big grin on his face. The caption, obviously one of those written using Snapchat, said something like, This is what happened to the last gold digger who was only after my cash. She said the girl seemed unconscious, but she honestly couldn't tell as her face was so badly beaten that her eyes were literally swollen shut. Her lips were split, blood was leaking down her neck and chin, it even looked like she had blood coming out of her ears. She said that, coupled with a horrifically violent image, the guy's big, wide, satisfied smile was one of the most disturbing, bone-chilling things she'd ever seen. She brought up the guy's profile and it used, I hate gold diggers as his name. All the other pictures were of the same guy, showing off fancy cars and fancy apartments and stuff. Obviously quite a well-off guy, but also a total psycho. His bio was just this long rant about how all of these women deserve to be on the streets and all this other stuff with zero punctuation or proper grammar, like a pure stream of consciousness of pure hatred towards women. All women by the sounds of it too, not just girls that were just after his money, if he even really had any. My friend said she saw some pretty messed up stuff on the regular, but nothing that's ever actually shook her as much as that picture did. She got out her phone and basically broke company policy by taking high-def close-ups of all this guy's profile pictures. After that, she went straight to her head of department to ask permission to pass on the guy's profile to the police. Usually, they just ban the person's account and move on, but she said there's all kinds of metadata you can get from a picture like that, especially when a copy is actually uploaded to an app and it's not just a screenshot or a photo of a photo, if that makes any sense. I always thought it was kind of funny that she had to look at wieners all day and she basically has to be the Tinder police for a living. But then, after she told me that story, along with the other legit messed up stuff she sees, I don't think it's so funny anymore. My name is Chiro, and although I live and work in New York City these days, 
I was born and lived in Milan, Italy until my middle 20s. I work in tech and although I'm quite experienced and knowledgeable nowadays, I was the polar opposite when I started out. All I had was a computer, a very padded resume and a big fake it till you make it attitude. In the early 2000s, that's how I started working for one of the biggest internet companies in the world at the time, Yahoo. Not many people know this or remember this, but back when it was still a big provider, Yahoo ran an online dating website, one of the first of its kind. But unlike a lot of the free app-based dating services that are around today, you actually had to pay to use Yahoo Dating, kind of like a subscription. The only trouble was, and I know this is from the few pieces of analytics I ever saw, the service was almost exclusively men using it and very few women. That meant that most guys would buy a month subscription then simply cancel it when they realized that they hadn't talked to any women the whole time. And that's where my job came into things. You see, I was tasked with creating fake profiles of very beautiful women who would suddenly get in contact with the guy when his subscription was due to end. I'd lead them along enough to get them to renew their subscription and then when they did so, I'd basically just ghost on them, as people say these days. I was incentivized to do this, as I could show my bosses every user I was talking to that renewed their subscription and I would get monthly bonuses. I know that sounds incredibly unethical of me and admittedly it was, but I was young and dumb and I really needed the money. As I said, I lived in New York today and I was having to save up money for English lessons, plane tickets, apartment deposits, all the things I would need to move to another country. Because as much as I love Italy, as much as I still visit sometimes, and it will always be my true home, the wages are very bad, you need to bribe to get a promotion and job opportunities are terrible. Yes, I felt terrible sometimes tricking these guys into giving Yahoo their money when they had basically no chance of getting a date, but I told myself just a few more months and I'll quit, and that way I was able to keep on going. The final straw was this one guy who I should never have tried to trick. Unlike a lot of other users, this guy actually knew about computers way more than I did. I should have never messed with him, but like I said, I needed to make money so badly that I basically crossed the line from hustling to just being plain greedy. I tricked the guy into renewing his subscription twice and it was only because I was so good at making fake profiles. I remember hearing the English phrase, the devil is in the detail, and it's true, although in my case it was emphasis on devil for what I was doing. I'd give these fake women favorite songs, favorite poems, little flaws they tried to hide through things like, I can be a real neat freak, sorry if that bothers you, and it made them all the more human. I got really good at the job after a while, but I was just a good liar. I wasn't good or knowledgeable about computers, but the guy I was dealing with, he knew so much more. After the first time I tricked him into renewing his subscription, he was furious. I know that because I made another profile a few months later to trick him into renewing yet again. He didn't have any idea that the profile I used was fake. He was just angry and upset that the girl he liked had abandoned him. So he basically poured out all his frustrations to me, or rather, to the fake girl I had created. I kept the conversation ticking over until I was notified that he had renewed a subscription. And after that, I deleted the profile and set about making a new one. I can't imagine how upset and angry he must have been again, but I wasn't really thinking of anyone but myself. Then at the end of the next month, what do you know? His subscription was about to run out again. So for a third time, I make a fake profile of the exact kind of girl I knew he liked and set about tricking him for the third, and as I told myself, the final time. But it didn't quite go down that way. In fact, I ended up in America way quicker than I thought. After I made the profile, I sent him a message only to almost immediately get one back that said something like this, and I'm telling you, it made me so scared I thought I was about to throw up. Hello, Chiro. Yes, I know your name, and that's not all I know. I know where you are, how much you get paid, and I know you don't have long left to live. You really messed with the wrong person here. You see, I gave those girls the benefit of the doubt at first, but 
Then I started thinking it was suspicious, so I did a little digging, and that's how I found out all the messages you sent me were coming from the same computer. I'm good with computers, much better than you, and I learned so I could make money for my brother. I'm an earner for the Angdangeta, a very valued one too. I make them lots of money by skimming online transactions, so I'm worth a lot of money to them. I told them I would work for a week for free if they just did me one small favor, and that one small favor is killing you for revenge. You've humiliated me twice now, but I swear on Mother Mary that you will not humiliate a single other person. You will suffer greatly before you die. They have sworn that to me. And by the time you read this, they'll be on their way to you. You can try to run or hide, but we all know about you, Chiro. And in the end, we will find you. They use the term bacie avraci, meaning hugs and kisses. The same thing I always sign my messages off with to show he really had figured me out. So, like I said, that's how I ended up in America earlier than I expected. I lived terribly for a year because I blew all my savings on two things. One, I paid an Italian man to lie to immigration that I was his cousin and could stay with him. And two, I paid a lawyer to represent me to say that I was being targeted by the Andrangheta, which is what they call the mafia down in Calabria, where the computer guy was apparently from. And since this was basically true, it was easy to prove. I just needed someone who knew the law to work in my favor. And that, my reading friend, is how I came to be an American citizen. I stayed here long enough, worked hard enough, and paid enough taxes to be welcomed into the bosom of America. And although life isn't exactly paradise here all the time, I'm still glad I made the leap across the Atlantic. Because if not, I might not even be alive to write something like this. And I know that those who came to take revenge for their worker would have made me want to die before the end. On the night of February 29th, 2008, the Caffey family were fast asleep at their home in the small town of Alba in northeastern Texas. The family of five consisted of 41-year-old Terry Caffey, his 37-year-old wife Penny, and their three children, 8-year-old Tyler, 13-year-old Matthew, and 16-year-old Aaron. They bonded over their love of music and their love of Jesus, and often played in a family band at Sunday services with Tyler on guitar, Matthew on harmonica, and Penny on piano. Aaron fronted the group and wowed audiences all over the Southwest with her sweet angelic voice and cherubic appearance. All her young life, she was a picture of innocence, her parents' blonde-haired, blue-eyed pride and joy. But just after her 16th birthday, Erin met a person that would not only have a catastrophic effect on her life, but also the lives of her beloved family members. But the devastation they wrought also raised a very serious question. Was Erin really as innocent as she seemed? Or was there something darker, deep inside of her, that drove her to become complicit in an act of pure evil? Shortly after Aaron entered her 16th year, she announced that she'd found herself a boyfriend. But when she brought him around to meet her parents, he wasn't quite what they were expecting. Not only was Charlie Wilkinson three years older than Aaron, but both Terry and Penny picked up some decidedly bad vibes from him. His intentions for their daughter seemed less than pure, and his checkered past left much to be desired. Early on, I had reservations about the young man. Terry later said, There were just things about him that didn't sit right with me. I talked to young people about the dangers of running with the wrong crowd, and Charlie ticked all the boxes of someone I didn't want dating my daughter. The Caffey parents were then faced with two options. Intervene directly and essentially force Aaron to break up with Charlie, or simply keep a watchful eye out and allow their daughter to make her own mistakes. The former would no doubt cultivate a deep, festering resentment for them, 
while the latter would foster boundless trust when Aaron realized that they were right. They opted for the latter. As the weeks went by, the Caffeys continued to hope their daughter's errant relationship would simply fizzle out on its own. We've been dealing with Aaron, with the rebellion going on and keeping an eye on everything, Terry explained. Yet little did he know, tragedy was about to strike. On February 21st, 2008, Terry popped over to visit his elderly father, Clarence, who lived alone on the other side of town. But when he knocked on the front door, Clarence didn't answer. His car was in the driveway, so he must have been home. But when Terry went around to the back door and entered his father's home, he was greeted by a heartbreaking sight. Clarence was laying dead on the kitchen floor, having suffered a massive heart attack. What followed was an extremely tough week for the Caffey family, yet it seemed the worst was yet to come. A few days after we buried my dad, we found out some things through Charlie's MySpace page, Terry stated. After we saw those things, references to drinking and other highly inappropriate activity, we pulled Aaron aside and told her that we didn't raise her like that, and that he was not good for her. Aaron didn't take the intervention well, but no one could have guessed what she'd do next. Two days after the intervention, on the night of February 29th, Charlie Wilkinson pulled up outside the Caffey family's home, accompanied by 20-year-old Charles Allen Wade and Charlie's 18-year-old girlfriend Bobby Gail Johnson. Wilkinson pulled out his cell phone and sent a short message to Aaron Caffey. Moments later, Aaron crept out of the house in her pajamas before climbing into her boyfriend's vehicle. After that, Wilkinson and Charles Wade walked up to the house entering through the front door which Aaron had left ajar. Terry Caffey said that around two o'clock in the morning, he was awoken by a strange noise in the hallway outside his bedroom. At first, he thought it was simply one of his children making a midnight trip to the bathroom, but when he heard two adult males whispering to each other, he realized that something was horribly wrong. The next I knew, Terry later said, they burst into our bedroom and opened fire, shooting me several times. And not only did they come in shooting, they also came in with a samurai sword. After they shot Penny, they shot me three more times in the back and once in the back of the leg. All in all, I think I had been shot eleven times. I couldn't feel the right side of my body and nothing would come out of my mouth. I felt like I'd been shot in the face. Then one of them took the sword and stabbed Penny in the neck nearly decapitating her. Just minutes into the attack, Terry Caffey had lost a dangerous amount of blood, but as he drifted in and out of consciousness, his only thought were of his two boys, who were no doubt terrified in their third floor bedrooms. I began to panic, Terry told journalists in the aftermath of the slaughter. I was trying to get up, and I heard Matthew begin to cry out. He said, No, Charlie, no. Why are you doing this? When I heard his name mentioned by Matthew, I knew who was in my house and why he was there. And then I heard the gunfire. I tried to get up again, but the blood rushed into my head, and I collapsed. I was later told Matthew had been shot, whereas they took turns stabbing Tyler, who was hiding in a closet. When the attackers were done massacring the family... They went about setting fire to the Caffey's family's home. The next time I woke up, the house was on fire, Caffey said. I knew I wasn't able to get upstairs because the flames were just pushing me back into the bedroom, so I crawled onto the bed and found Penny. She was already gone. I finally managed to crawl out of our bedroom window and then drag myself away from the house. Terry was so weak from the loss of blood that it took him almost two hours to crawl just 300 yards in his neighbor's house to get help. When he reached Tommy Gaston's house, Gaston immediately called 911. Moments into the call, the operator asked Gaston where Terry was bleeding from, and according to the call transcripts, Gaston replied with, Where isn't he bleeding from? It's a miracle he's here at all. 
When paramedics arrived at the Gaston house, they rushed Terry to the East Texas Medical Center in Tyler and admitted him to the critical care unit for immediate treatment. Meanwhile, based on a statement Terry gave on his hospital bed, the police set out tracking down Charlie Wilkinson and Charles Wade. They were found hiding out with Aaron inside a trailer that belonged to Wade's older brother. At first, Aaron was not considered a suspect as police believed she was a kidnap victim, but during questioning, Charles Wade made a shocking admission. He told homicide detectives that he had been promised a payment of just over $2,000 for his part in the murders, and the person that had sworn to pay him was none other than Aaron Caffey. Charlie Wilkinson's story was the same, but in his case, he could provide evidence of the promise in the form of text message exchanges between himself and Aaron. Aaron was arrested while on the way to visit her father in the hospital, and along with her fellow defendants, she was charged with three counts of capital murder. Terry Caffey was nothing short of stunned at the revelation. After burying my family, I went back to stay with my sister for a while and was reduced to living on her couch, and everything I owned was in the cardboard box, Terry said. Just a few weeks prior to that, I had a beautiful home acreage and a beautiful family. It was all gone. Understandably, Terry Caffey sank deep into a grief-stricken depression and even considered taking his own life. I planned on taking my own life. I decided that when I got well enough to travel, I was going to go back to my property and I was just going to end it. So when that day came, I went back there and stood on the ashes and began to cry to God. I said, God, I don't understand why you took my family. Why did you do this? I just didn't understand. No sooner than I said that, Terry continued. I looked down and saw this scrap piece of paper from a book that was all burned around its edges. I picked it up and it read, I couldn't understand why you would take my family and leave me behind the struggle along without them. I may never totally understand that part of it, but... I do know that you are sovereign. You are in control. When I read those words, I was like, wow, it literally brought me to my knees. The page was from a book titled Blind Sight, a novel about a man who loses his wife and two children in a car accident and must learn to come to grips with the tragedy. It was written by Jim Pence, who's now a good family friend said Terry. He was my kid's karate instructor and he had written several books. He hadn't read this particular one. He had given it to my wife about two or three years before the murders. That crumpled page described exactly where I was at that moment. It was then that I realized that God had put all this together and I knew that I had been spared for a reason. All Terry needed by that point was one final piece or closure and according to him, before he could move on with his life, he had to forgive those who took the lives of his family. His shocking twist of the tale, Terry intervened on behalf of Charlie Wilkinson and Charles Wade and asked a Texan judge to rule out the possibility of either receiving the death penalty. I wanted them to have a chance to find remorse and hopefully be sorry for what they had done. I wanted them to have a chance for repentance. Terry wrote in his letter to the judge, the process took several months, but eventually a plea deal was reached, a condition of which was that both Wilkinson and Wade had to explain their actions in a face-to-face -face meeting with Terry Caffey. The only little bit of remorse I got was from Charlie, Caffey said. He kept looking down and cried a little bit. It was pretty tough for him. He told his lawyer later that it was the toughest thing he had ever had to do. I was glad to know that he was suffering in that way, but... I don't think he deserves to die. The real test came when Terry confronted his own daughter on her role in the murders. I asked her about it and she started crying. He said, She told me, I have nothing to hide from you. I'll tell you anything you want. Aaron told her father that she knew of the plot in advance, but thought that they were only going to intimidate her parents into giving her up. In reality... The others forced her to wait in the car while they killed her family. She told me that Charlie had tried to pin it on her 
saying she was the mastermind and he was just going along with it because she was brainwashed by him. Terry stated, But I don't believe that's true. I know my daughter, and that's not her. Terry has admitted that his decision to forgive his daughter and the others has brought a lot of criticism, but he says he doesn't let it bother him. People ask me how I could forgive my daughter, and how I can forgive those who murdered my family. But I'm not trying to justify anything. This is my daughter, and I know what's best for us. In October 2008, Charlie Wilkinson and Charles Wade were each sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Then, just three months later, and despite her father's objections, Erin Caffey pled guilty to murder. She was given two consecutive life sentences, plus 25 years for conspiracy to murder. According to court documents, she won't be eligible for parole until she's in her mid-50s. Terry Caffey has since remarried and is now a stepfather to two children. He has since resigned from his job with a medical supply company and now focuses on his motivational speaking engagements. He also authored a book entitled Terror by Night, which details the murders of his family as well as the reclamation of his sanity. He co-authored the book with Jim Pence, author of Blind Sight, the book which saved his life. Nowadays, Terry visits churches and public schools to talk about all he has endured in an effort to reach to others in a positive way. I get emails and letters just about every day from all over the country, from people who are hurting and suffering, he said in a 2010 interview. People who are going through maybe similar things or maybe things just totally completely opposite of what I've gone through, but yet I've been able to help. I try to use my tragedy in a positive way to reach others, he added. I want people to know that no matter how dark things get, no matter how impossible they seem, there's always a way back. There's always a road to redemption. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, always leave your honey out to keep the boogeyman away. Uh-huh.